and uh, a place that's near and dear to actually a lot of our hearts. I don't know how many of you have been to Charleston, but it's a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, and I know for a fact that the mayor there, Joe Riley, is pulling his hair out, and he has been for about 30 years as mayor of Charleston, about this situation. This is uh, showing uh, two slides. One example of what the, uh, what the city would look like with one meter sea level rise. The one on the lower right-hand side is two meters of sea level rise. Uh, so the city that we've gotten to know and love is not going to be the city that we'll be looking at um, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and this is something about sea level rise that, of course, is a little bit difficult. And something, of course, the underwriters and the mayors want to know about is how deep is it going to get and how soon. Uh, IPCC has predicted that maybe two feet by 2100. And as soon as that report came out, most of the scientific consensus was to me that's really, really conservative. Uh, especially when you take a look at what's happening on the uh, on the fringes of the Greenland ice sheet and uh, as well in the Western Antarctic area. And this is indeed a global problem. Uh, we've got our challenges. Certainly we have an example in New Orleans. We're going to have examples from cities like Charleston and from, who knows, Manhattan perhaps in the not too distant future. Uh, but this gives you just a, a sort of pointed example of what the folks in China are looking at. 80% of GDP by 2050 is projected to be located in deltaic cities that are sinking as seas are rising. And uh, the other interesting point here is that you don't have to have a whole lot of sea level rise to get a whole lot of impact, uh, especially in some of these low-lying coastal areas where just a little bit of water can go a long way. For example, 30 centimeters of sea level rise in those areas results in five to six times the amount of flooding damage. Um, the hopeful part of this discussion is there are things that we can do. And this goes back to the basic point. If it was just about climate change, then we'd all be maybe a whole lot more concerned uh, about our capacity as a society to deal with the, the threats that we're creating in that arena. But there are things that we can do in terms of the choices that we make that can have huge implications. This is just an indication from a Wharton uh, School study uh, and uh, I have to say the Risk Center at the Wharton School is a tremendous partner of ours in this Resilient Coast initiative. Um, what they have found is, is obvious from the words here. Um, and the, the, uh, the other key point is, well, I'll get to it in just a second. Um, one of the things that we were endeavoring to do is to not only add to this body of knowledge, and it's clear, these are all reports that are basically done within the financial sector most of which were looking at risks associated with climate change. So there's no lack of intellectual capital that's being invested in this issue of the threats that we face, the vulnerabilities that we have, and the costs that we're going to incur. Uh, but obviously something needs to happen because these reports get produced and they sit. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is explore uh, how we might address uh, the, the problem with getting from where we are with that knowledge and as you can see, we, you know, we've got a lot of knowledge about the environment, we have social and, and economic costs, we've generated reports talking about all that stuff. But when you start to work in the political system, what you're finding is a great deal of resistance to these things that are otherwise very common sense approaches to this problem. None of us would build our house on the lip of an active volcano. And yet we have no compunctions whatsoever to investing billions of dollars right on the edge of the ocean, which we know is rising and where we know the storm is going to come. So there are issues related to where we locate that development, how we develop that development. In other words, not only is it important to find the right place or avoid the hazard, might be another way of putting it, but when you build something, make sure that, for example, the roof stays on when the wind blows. And then dealing with a host of insurance regulatory issues that I'll talk about more, but all in a way of trying to get through this political impediment to get to the resilience that we need and can, from a technical point of view, so easily achieve. So what was the prescription? What did this group of people that represents folks from the insurance industry, the reinsurers, from the Nature Conservancy, National Wildlife Federation, the Working School, NOAA, the Coastal States Organization, um, what do they say that we ought to do? And as you look through this list of suggestions, which are the key principles coming out of this report, there's no rocket science here. This is all pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, what I'll do is walk through each of these components just a little bit more to, to flesh them out. 
But again, nothing here should be terribly surprising, particularly this first point where everybody needs better information. Granted, we know enough to be aware that we need to plan ahead and we need to have climate change be a part of those considerations. But boy, could we use better information, whether you're an insurance underwriter or the mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, on what's going on with sea level rise, how fast it's going to rise, how deep it's going to get. Uh, we certainly also could use better information, help us model more particularly uh, what the nature of storm threats are going to be and, and to, to hide <coughs> some of the uncertainties there. And as those of you who are out kayaking and beach profiling today know well now, uh, we need better data in terms of how high it is along our coast, how deep the water is going to get under different circumstances, um, and generate the kinds of maps that not only help us to plan better, but help us to communicate these issues better. Uh, FEMA, for example, is in charge of flood maps for the country, and it's been excruciatingly difficult to get them to produce maps that are up to date so that people know whether they're at risk and to, to what degree they might be at risk, and to allow the system to price insurance in such a way as to reflect the nature and extent of it. On uh, land use, this is pretty 